Hey guys and welcome back, or if you're new around here, hi, my name's Georgia and on my platforms here on the internet I talk about true crime and today we're going to be talking about an unsolved case. Our case today is one which you probably haven't heard of before but one that I do believe with a bit more public awareness really could be solved. This case dates back to 2002, Rachel Cook went missing over 22 years ago now, but no one, her family or law enforcement, have given up on finding the person responsible for her abduction and assumed murder. Although 22 years have passed, new information is coming out about this case on a kind of semi-regular basis. It is beyond clear to me that the police do have a lot more information in this case than they've ever shared with the public. They have information they're holding back to pin down the killer with if they're found, when they're found. And I suppose I have to say when here because I have every hope that we're inching closer to that day. This case is going to get solved. Like, I am so sure of that. So Rachel Louise Cook was a college student who was born and raised in Georgetown in Texas. Now nowadays Georgetown is a decent sized city but the 2000 census tells me that when Rachel disappeared she would have been one of less than 30,000 people living in this area. At the time of her disappearance she was attending Mesa Junior College in San Diego, California and she just returned home for the Christmas holidays, settling back into life with her family, her parents Robert and Janet and her sister Joanne. The family lived at 224 Navajo Trail in the North Lake subdivision of Georgetown and Robert and Janet had designed their home from scratch. Everything in it was specified to them and to their family. And the area in which they lived, North Lake, was a particularly quiet area as well, like all the houses were set quite far back from the road and they were all on multiple acres of land. So even though the Cooks did have neighbours, it's not like you'd pop your head out the front door and be able to say hello and wave at somebody, like they were kind of middle of nowhere. It was tranquil and it was spacious, just like the Cooks planned when they designed it. And very importantly, Georgetown, North Lake in particular, had a very low crime rate. Bad things just didn't really happen around here. So the whole family was happy as anything that Christmas, or I should say winter break. They settled back into their own routines very quickly and Rachel was particularly happy at this time because she'd met somebody whilst at college and had started dating him. He was called Greg. And that Christmas, she'd even brought him back home to Georgetown to meet and spend time with her family over the break. Now he'd only spent about a week there before he headed back to California to spend Christmas with his own family, but Rachel was just really content and happy with her life. Like she'd met this guy and she was so sure that this was the person she was going to be spending the rest of her life with, like she was just blissfully happy. At this point she was even considering switching to a different college in Los Angeles to study fashion design instead of her current course in San Diego. So Rachel was 19 years old, she was figuring out her place in the world and she was doing it really well, like the world was her oyster. Her and Greg even planned to move in together when they got back to California and friends said that she was even maybe hoping for an engagement once the college year was done, so big things were happening for her. But then that would all come to a horrible, abrupt end on the morning of Thursday the 10th of January 2002. This was a morning that started like any other, Robert and Janet both left for work whilst Joanne hedged off to high school, leaving Rachel asleep on the sofa. Robert would later remember Rachel being a bit grouchy that morning, all the people were like coming in and out and waking her up just like we all would be. She wasn't super angry but just like you know when you first woken up and people are annoying you and you just want to pull the covers over your head and go back to sleep, like that was the kind of vibe. So when they all left, Rachel was safe and sound and sleepy but when Robert returned home around 3pm with plans to take her shopping, she was nowhere to be seen. Rachel was actually going to a wedding in a couple of days and she wanted to get some things for that. Robert said he'd take her to go to the shops and he did think it was a little bit odd that she wasn't there like waiting and raring to go but he didn't panic. He thought maybe she'd been picked up by a friend and had just forgotten. She was due to be going out with her friend Shannon later that night anyway so maybe she'd just gone early. But Rachel didn't have access to a car while she was back so if she was gone somebody must have picked her up. But he would notice that all of Rachel's things had been left behind. Her phone and her purse were still in the house and we're talking about a 19 year old girl here. Like she's not going to go out with her friends for the evening and leave her phone behind, even in 2002. 
So the hours tick by and later that evening, Robert decides to give Shannon a call just to check that she's definitely with Rachel, but of course she wasn't. Shannon says she hadn't heard from her all day actually. So Robert's next call was to Wildfire, a local restaurant that Rachel would sometimes pick up shifts at when she was home just for a bit of extra money. And thank God, because when he called them and asked if Rachel was working that evening, the person who answered the phone said yes, yes she was. But it would turn out that there were two Rachels who worked at Wildfire and it was the wrong Rachel on shift. So they waited for the usual shift finishing time and she still didn't return home. As the hours passed, her family were getting more and more concerned. I mean, even if she had been on shift, it was very unusual for her anyway to leave her things behind and also not to even leave a note letting them know where she was. She usually always left a note, but hey, maybe it was just last minute and she forgot. But her parents decide to take a look through Rachel's belongings just to see if anything was missing, see if anything could give them clues as to where she might have gone. And they realise that the only things missing were her running clothes, grey running bottoms and a top, a green sports bra and her A6 running shoes. Her yellow Walkman disc player was also missing, which she usually wore on her arm with sports style headphones. And all of this pointed towards the fact that Rachel had more than likely gone on a run and not returned home. Rachel was a very enthusiastic runner, she'd been a cross country runner throughout high school and that wasn't something that stopped now she was in college. She ran four to six miles every single day, she usually got up and went for a run first thing every morning. But if she'd done the same that morning, gone for a run, she would definitely be home by now, like she'd usually be gone for like an hour, hour and a half tops, to not be back after eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve hours, no, something was wrong. Horrible images started running through Robert and Janet's minds, picturing her injured on her route somewhere, having fallen or being hit by a car. Like for them, that was the worst case scenario. It couldn't be anything other than that. So the next morning, Robert heads out to drive Rachel's usual running route, see if they could see any sign of her. And Janet went to the hospital to see if they'd had any unidentified females check in. All of this time they were searching themselves and hadn't contacted the police because they had fallen victim to the very common misconception that you have to wait 24 hours before reporting a missing person to the police. If you have reason to believe that somebody is missing, you report it to law enforcement as soon as you can. Now, most of the time that person is going to return unharmed, but where that's not the case, the first 48 hours are by far the most important in any investigation. Even if you do report it and you get fobbed off, at least they've got it in their records, like you've tried, at least you've done something. Rachel was officially reported as missing on Friday the 11th of January and it was a frustratingly slow start to the investigation as whoever they originally made the report to didn't really seem to see any need to rush. They decided they were gonna wait until the Monday to pass on the message to the relevant people. With the police seeming to drag their feet, the cooks got together everyone they knew to go out on foot and search for Rachel. And then soon somebody at the Texas Rangers hears about what's going on and and they can't fathom that an official police search hasn't taken place. So this person, whoever he was, pulled some strings and got together an official search. They teamed up with Texas EquiSearch, a volunteer search and rescue organization to actually get professionals out on the ground searching. Despite the amount of people they had out there, they couldn't find a single trace of Rachel. It really was like she just vanished into thin air. The search continued over the weekend through the Monday, at which point it was ended. But Robert said he would continue to run this search on weekends for nine whole months. He told The Guardian in September 2004, but at some point we thought we've done our best. If they took her 12 miles, there's no reason why they shouldn't have taken her 15 miles. We could search the whole of Texas and still not find her. But whilst the physical searches came to an end, the investigation as a whole was only just beginning. Now fully on board, police officers canvassed the area. They asked the neighbors if they'd seen Rachel on her run that morning. And despite the fact that the neighbors here weren't exactly in close proximity to each other, multiple people had seen Rachel. By this point, they'd already spoken to Greg, who had flown back to Texas as soon as he heard the news that Rachel was missing. He said that he'd spoken to her on the phone that morning, he actually called her and woke her up, and she told him that she was gonna go on a run and then she'd call him back afterwards, but she never did. Phone records showed that this call ended at 9.15 a.m. So we can assume that she hung up and within just a number of minutes probably was out on the road on her run. 
And the neighbor stories did all back this up. At around 10 a.m., a couple who were out for a walk said they saw a girl who they believed was Rachel out for a run. About 20 minutes later, she passed them again and they said everything looked fine. She didn't look like she was being followed or was distressed at all, she was just running. Not long before 11 a.m., a neighbor was backing out of their driveway in their car when they saw Rachel coming down the road and they stopped to let her pass. It seemed like at this point she was calling off, which does make sense, seeing as she was only 200 yards from her home. She was so, so close to making it back home again, but there's no evidence that she ever made it that far. Somehow, somewhere in that 200 yards, Rachel vanished, most likely was abducted. In those early days, investigators thought it was most likely that she was abducted by somebody that she knew, that maybe she stopped and was chatting to somebody, maybe they pulled up in a car next to her and then they grabbed her. Maybe she even agreed to get in the car to have a chat. I mean, this was her hometown after all. She knew people around here. It wasn't out of the question that she would run into somebody that she knew. And there was no evidence of foul play or a struggle of any kind. So they looked at all the people closest to Rachel and tried to rule them out one by one. The first and most obvious place to look was her boyfriend, Greg, but he was undoubtedly in California at the time of her disappearance, as proven by his phone records and witnesses. He was given a polygraph test anyway though, and he passed it incredibly easily. In fact, her entire family were given polygraph tests and everyone passed with flying colours, apart from her dad, Robert. When he was asked if he knew where Rachel was, he said no, but it flagged that he was lying. He would later say that he thinks it's because in his heart of hearts, he did know where she was, in heaven. And we all know that polygraph tests actually mean very little. They catch lies through stress levels. And when you're dealing with a highly stressful situation like this one, the results are going to be naturally all over the place. There was no more suspicion on Robert after this point, like he just didn't do it. He spent the rest of his life searching for his daughter and he sadly died from natural causes in 2014. Rachel Cook was 19 years old when she went missing. If she's still alive today, she'll be 42 years old, soon to be 43. She was white, five foot two to five foot three, 110 to 125 pounds, with strawberry blonde hair with auburn streaks. She had hazel eyes, and in terms of any distinguishing features, she had multiple piercings in her ears, her belly button pierced, and two tattoos. Two heart-shaped cherries on the left shoulder, and a star on her left foot. The general consensus is that foul play was involved in her disappearance and she likely died not long after she was abducted. But without a body, we don't know that for sure. There is a chance, however slim that chance is, that she could still be out there somewhere. Her dad always said that he lived in that tiny, tiny hope that maybe she hit her head, had amnesia and just went off to start a new life somewhere. They don't believe that she would have run away intentionally, but the amnesia thing, that has happened to people before. It could have happened to Rachel and they lived in that tiny hope. The investigators don't subscribe to that train of thought though and on the Doe Network and Charlie Project, she is officially listed as endangered missing. Witnesses in the area at the time Rachel went missing told investigators of an unidentified male driving around in either a late model white or blue Chevrolet Camaro or Pontiac Trans Am with white or black stripes along the hood and the trunk. The driver was described as being in his late teens or early 20s with slicked back, dark hair and a dark complexion. He may have been Hispanic. We do have three composite sketches available of this unidentified man, all from different witnesses. And whilst the general vibe between all these sketches is very similar, they do all look like completely different men, just generic men with dark hair. So I'm not entirely sure how helpful these sketches would really be. Some witnesses reportedly described him as driving along the Navajo Trail, the road on which the Cooks lived, turning southbound onto Nietzsche's trail. Some witnesses also claimed to have seen two men inside the car instead of one. There was also a separate car, a white pickup truck, the wide dark colored stripe along its lower portion that was seen driving around the North Lake subdivision on the day in question. Witnesses stated that both the sports car and the truck, so I think it was a bit confused, stopped along the road to talk to a jogger, likely Rachel, around the time of her disappearance. So investigators released all this information to the public in the hope that more people might come forward with information, and a lot of tips came in on the back of this. According to the Charlie Project, investigators did announce that one of the unidentified men did come forward voluntarily a week later, and he was subsequently cleared of any involvement in the case. 
And I don't know if this is the same person or not, but two young boys also came forward to say that they'd been skipping school that day and they'd been sort of driving around aimlessly in a similar car. And they might have looked very suspicious, which they were, but just because they were skipping school, not because they had anything to do with Rachel's disappearance. Police checked their story out and they were also cleared. For a while, investigators really focused in on the potential Hispanic angle of this case. Rachel's family even said that over the break, Rachel had made a couple of comments about workers, subcontractors in the area, staring at her and making comments while she was on her runs. A lot of said workers were Hispanic and a lot of them were also undocumented, which always complicates cases like this. It means there's no official list of workers for which investigators go and talk to, and it also means that these people are very unlikely to come forward and share information themselves because they're undocumented. They'll be raising awareness of themselves to the police. But whilst police were very much looking at this angle, they were still pretty convinced that it must have been somebody that Rachel knew, thanks to the apparent lack of a struggle. For a little bit, their attention would turn to Rachel's ex-boyfriend, who was having a bit of trouble apparently getting over her. Now, his name has never been released to the public, and he's never been named an official suspect. At the time, he wasn't even a person of interest, but it is said they had quite a volatile relationship. They'd bumped into each other whilst at a party when Rachel was back, and they'd had a bit of an argument. This boyfriend, ex-boyfriend, told Rachel that he still loved her, he was begging for her to get back with him, whilst Rachel had very happily moved on with Greg. Janet would even say how this ex-boyfriend had turned up at their front door one night at 3am and she had threatened to call the sheriff to make him leave. And considering what would come to happen to Rachel, this is suspicious behaviour. But under any other circumstances, this is just a teenager having very big feelings and a not quite fully developed frontal lobe, getting drunk and making bad choices. Due to the fact investigators did seem to move on from him quite quickly, I'm going to assume that maybe he had a pretty good alibi for the time Rachel disappeared, but we don't really have any more information than that. We don't know. And with that, the case would just end up hitting a bit of a dead end. Over the next couple of years, Robert and Janet would end up divorcing thanks to the stress, although they did always remain very close in their search for Rachel. Robert became obsessed with finding his daughter's killer. It took over his entire life, whilst Janet just wanted to get to a point where she could move on. Both of which are very understandable ways of coping, but you can see how it would put a huge strain on their marriage. And then there was also a bit of drama with Sheriff Maspero, the man who had been leading this case in the early days. He was forced out of office whilst being investigated for serious misconduct, including allegations of sexual harassment in the workplace and indecent exposure. Which is kind of besides the point of Rachel's case specifically, but I think it's worth mentioning nonetheless. Like, this is kind of like more law enforcement being just a bit shit, just a bit corrupt, being criminals potentially themselves. It wouldn't be until 2006 that there was a real break in this case. A task force was put together to solve it, but it would be quickly disbanded and all the files were handed over just to one man to keep a hold of. And then one day, this man got a call from somebody in prison, convicted killer Michael Keith Moore, who confessed there and then to abducting and killing Rachel. Moore was serving four life terms for killing a pregnant woman called Christina Moore during a robbery in the neighbouring town of Round Rock. And this was a man with a very detailed criminal history dating all the way back to 1993, when he received a 60-day sentence for using a BB gun to break into multiple homes and cars. This was kind of like a weekend sentence. He failed to check in for his first weekend stint because by that point, he was already being held in county jail for punching his girlfriend and putting a knife to her throat. After that point, he would go to prison for four and a half years. Over the next decade, Moore would commit a number of crimes with sexual motivations, including an assault on his stepdaughter after he broke into her home. In September 2003, he attended a party in Georgetown where a 20-year-old woman would later report being raped. No charges were filed because, of course, they're never filed in rape cases, but just three days later, he would kill Christina Moore in Round Rock. He was caught when four days later, he anonymously phoned investigators to say that he'd found checks with Christina's name on in a payphone coin return slot. Then when Moore's stepdaughter came to the police to talk about how he had broken into her home to try and assault her, she mentioned that he once claimed to have checks with Christina's name. So they played her the audio tape of an anonymous caller and she identified the voice as Moore's. Two days later, he's being questioned and he's eventually arrested and convicted, going to prison. 
This is just all round not a good man, just an evil man. Even his own father washed his hands of him, realising that Moore was somebody who just lacked a conscience. He committed crimes and he didn't care about how they affected other people. Like, even as a kid, he showed no regard for others. This was just a repeat offender, somebody who believed he was more powerful than the police, more powerful than everyone. Perfectly encapsulated in the anonymous call to the police about Christina's murder, taunting them, believing that he wouldn't get caught. Which could be why, in 2006, he contacted the authorities and confessed to being responsible for the murder and abduction of Rachel Cook. He said that on that day, he was driving around Georgetown just looking for something to steal, when he saw Rachel jogging and just decided in that moment to take her. He said he came up to her from behind, struck her in the head with a hammer, put her in the car and drove her to another location where he assaulted her. He then said he wrapped her body in a tarp, weighed it down with rocks, and threw it into Matagorda Bay, a 180 mile, three hour drive south. Authorities were quick, probably too quick, to believe his version of events. I mean, it did perfectly match his usual MO of violence towards women. He also had nothing to gain from a false confession. So they went through the process of a plea bargain. He was to plead guilty to Rachel's murder and lead investigators to where he left her body. He would also show them where he'd buried her jewellery and personal items. But then, when he entered the courtroom on November 9th, 2006, in front of all of Rachel's family and friends, who finally believed they were about to get answers, he stood there and pled not guilty. This was a shock to everyone, and just more pain for her family, who were desperate for answers. They thought they had him, and now he's there pleading not guilty. He confessed, like, how does this work? At the time, investigators just didn't really know what to think. Like, why get to this point and then go back on your confession? What was his motivation to confess in the first place? At the time, they worked to build a case against him regardless of the not guilty plea. They fully believed that he was the one responsible. If they could just get it to trial, he could be facing the death penalty, which is what they were trying to avoid with the original plea bargain. But they could just never build up the case. It never got that far. Nowadays, investigators do tend to think that Moore just made it up, probably just for a bit of attention. When you're bored in prison, serving four life sentences, and you're just not a good person who enjoys messing with others, why not? Like, what has he got to lose? He would have known how similar this crime was to his others, that it would be taken seriously, it would get him out of his cell for a little bit, and eventually that whole investigation just ended in nothing. If it was Moore who killed Rachel, there's never been any actual evidence to prove it. So once again, it all goes quiet. Please do follow up on leads that come in over the years. There have been over 1,700 leads in total, and they try to follow up on every single one. Around 2016, a new sheriff, Robert Chody, takes control of this case, and he gets together a group of veteran retired homicide detectives to start this investigation just completely from scratch, and a new cold case unit was created. They found a list of 100 people of interest in Rachel's case, and they started the process of re-interviewing every single person who was interviewed the first time round. Now, not everyone was willing to speak again for whatever reason, including some family members apparently, but they did what they could with this reinvestigation. And then, suddenly, in April 2018, there was a huge break in the case that kind of seemed to come out of nowhere. Officials announced they'd found the car linked to the disappearance. The car that was seen driving around the area at the time Rachel went missing. They announced it had been found in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and it was a 1998 white Pontiac Trans Am. For the public, and for the Cook family, this news just seemed to come out of absolutely nowhere. Like, what do you mean you found the car? Like, how do they know this was the exact correct car? All of this screams to me that they've had a lot more information than they ever shared publicly. That perhaps they've had a number plate or a partial number plate all along. It was reported in the April of 2018 that the Sheriff's Office received a tip about a Pontiac Trans Am in the Dallas area, a tip that must have had a very strong basis behind it, and the car was swiftly collected and transported back to Williamson County, where FBI forensic analysts collected evidence. Now, it's never been announced who made the tip or who this car belongs to, although the police must have that information. Preliminary testing did find the presence of blood on an item in the passenger floorboard and the passenger door moulding, but more testing was being conducted. 
And then it was announced that the full results of this testing would never be released to the public, just in order to protect the integrity of the investigation. And they have remained true to their word. We're in 2024 now and we have no more information about this. The fact that we are now in 2024 though and no arrests have been made doesn't fill me with hope about what they found. Around this same time, there were also a couple of big digs in the area looking for Rachel. There was one in June 2017, a tip prompting the Williamson County Sheriff's Office and the FBI to dig a 15 by 20 foot area about five miles north of Liberty Hill, but they found nothing. In December 2018, there was also another dig in a field by the intersection of County Roads 971 and Texas 130 in Georgetown. Again, they declined to say whether anything of interest was found, but a spokeswoman did say that they were moving on to other leads in the case, so we can assume that nothing huge was found. But investigators are still not willing to give up on this case. They are determined to get answers for Rachel's loved ones. In January 2021, it was announced they were now seeking a person who lived in the Georgetown area in 2002, somebody who was said to have travelled to multiple cities throughout the state of Texas. This person has also been described as being an associate of Rachel's when she was in Georgetown and is known to have been involved in the cattle or horse industry. It's believed that he may have mentioned something to an acquaintance about Rachel's disappearance. Apparently he was speaking in the third person at the time and he was sort of like maintaining distance from any actual involvement. This, whatever was said was kind of suspicious enough that whoever they were speaking to has clearly left a tip with the police and now they're trying to follow up on this. Now that seems to have been the last really big update in this case. I don't know if they ever found the person in question, but it's very clear they're not giving up on Rachel anytime soon. I very much do suspect that investigators know a hell of a lot more in this case than they've ever shared with the public, but surely there comes a point 22 years on where maybe it's worth just sharing some more stuff with the public. Like if you haven't caught the perpetrator over two decades on, just lay all your cards on the table, like surely. Over the years, there have been a lot of false alarms, a lot of human remains found in the area, and every time the cooks hold their breath, thinking that this time it's going to be Rachel. One body was even found only nine miles from their home, and apparently that was the worst one to wait for an answer on. I mean, there's this certain pain that comes from your loved ones being missing, more so than just the simpler grief of somebody dying. You've always got that modicum of hope. You make peace with the fact that they're gone, and then you think, but what if, like what if they're still alive? What if I can still find them and the hope ignites all over again, only bringing in more pain? The cooks haven't had their chance to lay Rachel to rest and I hope more than anything that they get that one day. The Williamson County Sheriff's Office and the FBI are offering a reward of up to $100,000 for any information leading to the location of Rachel Cook. I'll leave all of the relevant information in the description box. If you have anything that may be of help to investigators, then please do not hesitate to contact them. They are actively following up on leads in this case. Like this is very much still an open case. They want to find answers. If you live in the Georgetown area or any of the surrounding areas, then please make sure you share this episode with people or just share Rachel's story with people. Get her name, get her face out there. As I said at the beginning of this episode, I truly believe this is a case that can be solved. It feels like they've got so many pieces of the puzzle. They just haven't got the connecting bits. And I really, as I said many times in this episode, I really, really do think the police have a lot more information than they're sharing. I think they're really not far from finding the killer, but we've just got to wait and see. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what I'm doing here on my channel, then please make sure you interact with this video in any way that you want to. Give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below. Comments are invaluable to sort of pushing videos out to the algorithm. If you're feeling really generous and you can become a channel member for just £2.99 a month, all you need to do is click the button below this video. You'll see it down there somewhere. The YouTube world is rough at the moment, so any help you can give me, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.